Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Peter Kapitein, and I'm Chief Medical Officer for Medtronic and Cardiac Surgeon from Rotterdam, the Netherlands. Today, we're going to discuss a couple of very important cases that will be presented by an esteemed faculty. It's, diff it's very important that we have these hallway conversations during annual meetings. Often people find them as interesting as going to lectures, um, and they are important because you can discuss things that you would normally not discuss in the meeting hall. So therefore, this title of this the webinar today is Case Presentations and Hallway Conversations on Mitral Valve Repair. The faculty that you see here on the slide is Dr. Stephen Bolling, Professor of Surgery, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor in Michigan. And he's joined by Joanna Chickby, the Chair and Department of Cardiac Surgery, Sina Sina Medical Center, Los Angeles in, in California. And of course, the third picture, as I already mentioned, I'm the Chief Medical Officer for uh, Structural Heart Cardiac Surgery and Mechanical Circuitry Support for Medtronic. And I'm happy to moderate this session, especially because you know, we have two experts in the field here. And so I'm really looking forward to it. And please keep in mind that you can also ask questions to this faculty and uh, we will filter them and get them um, answered um, at the end of this session. So first, let me hand over to Dr. Steve Bolling for his presentation. Peter, thanks. Uh, I'd also like to thank Joe uh, for being my hallway conversationalist and also to Medtronics for setting this up. You know, I think Zoom is great. I think we're almost over the hill. We'll soon have meetings where we see each other and it's important to have discussions. So I'm going to just say a little bit about why, you know, we think about much about therapy, why we now really think we should leave no MR behind. So I'll put some data slides up there. But I mean, mostly we're going to talk about back and forth, Joe and I, and Peter, please, you know, you'll chip into about what it is. And the, the first thing is, we know this, mitral volume predicts mitral repair. Why, why is that important? Well, th this is our first, you know, paper from almost a decade ago that really showed that the median surgeons, uh, median number of cases per surgeon is really particularly low. It's about five in the United States. That was 10 years ago. It may have gone up a little bit, but it's relatively low. And the data from that really says that the more you do, the better you are. It's not that you can't repair if you do very few mitral cases a year. It's just percentage-wise, chances are you're going to repair. And that just makes sense. The more you do, the better you are. And it's not really related to the patient's age. Papers have come out after this again and again and again. This is Medicaid, Medicare data. The older patients, this is still the more a surgeon does, the more likely that surgeon will be to repair the valve. It's not the hospital, it's really the surgeon. The surgeon effect very much overwhelms the hospital. It's not just the United States. It also occurs outside of the United States. This is in England. It's not just in Michigan. This is data from Virginia, it's the same. It's not just in Michigan, it's in New York. You know, really mitral valve surgery is very concentrated that there are some centers like this hospitals you can see in this graph that are doing a lot of mitral valve surgery and some that are not doing very much at all. And this really is uh, the latest data. It's very concentrated in the hands of some surgeons. And if you look at that data, it's very striking in that if you do less than 25 uh, mitrals a year, your repair rate is two out of three, 66%. If you're between 20, 25 and 100, your repair rate jumps up to 90. And if you do more than 100 a year, your repair rate is 99%. And again, all this data just says that the more that we do as surgeons, the more our expertise becomes, the better we are. Mitral volume predicts mitral repair. Why is that important for surgeons? Because mitral repair restores life expectancy. We've had lots of data, non-randomized, that have looked at this, that to basically to repair DMR is to cure DMR. We put that patient group back on their same survival as the general population. And of course, replacement cannot come anywhere near doing that. Of course, early repair is better than medical therapy or watchful waiting. I'm not even sure what medical management is for mitral regurgitation, just waiting for something to, terrible to happen. And in mitral repair, this is from Tyron Davids, long-term survival is excellent. This is just paper that came out in 2019, the 20-year survival was superb after mitral valve repair. We looked at it a slightly different way. We took the last thousand repairs that we done. These are straightforward repairs, and we divided them 
into whether we started with them in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and so on like that up to the 90s. And we said, does that still put them back on their survival line no matter what age we start them with? And it does. This is the waterfall cascade. And using a technique called Anderson Darling, we could actually look at the median survival for all 330 million Americans in the red dots there in the 20s, 30s, and 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And we overlay them with survival of mitral valve repair, and it's the same. It overlies itself. Mitral valve repair is curative no matter what age you start up. This was presented at a meeting at the AATS two years ago. It's published in JTCBS. So mitral valve repair is really important, you know, because mitral valve repair restores life expectancy. That's why mitral volume is important because it gets us to mitral repair, and mitral repair is important because it gets to restore the life expectancy. And then sort of the last thing, though, is that that life expectancy depends on a perfect repair. Just the mere fact of doing a mitral repair is not as important as doing a really good or a perfect mitral repair. And that's what this leave no MR behind is all about. So obviously, we've had lots of data. You know, we said years past, Joe's not old enough to remember this, but Peter certainly is. You know, when we said, oh, anterior leaflet's very hard. We can leave MR. It's okay. That's okay. It's an anterior leaflet. Now, those patients with MR recurrence did very poorly compared to no MR recurrence. And they, they of course, fall off their survival curve. And there's now lots of data out there that's showing freedom from postoperative MR depends on residual MR at the time of postoperative echo. And you can see the difference between zero and anything that's non-zero is huge. And Joe, I don't know how you think about it, but I tell my fellows that whatever we see at the time of coming off bypass will double. So if you leave one plus, as soon as they wake up and they walk around, they'll have two plus. If you leave two plus, they're going to have four plus. And if you leave zero, that will definitely double and that will be zero. So what are your thoughts on that, Joe? I think it's a great point. It very much depends on the mechanism of the MR that you're seeing when you take the clamp off. So one of the commonest causes of MR that we see is SAM. And obviously, there's a huge number of maneuvers you can make um, that will change that pretty radically if you haven't caused it with a size ring to valve mismatch. In terms of the other things, if it's a central jet and it's kind of between the leaflets, I'm not so sure that that will always get worse. Um, whereas jets that are from the suture line or from around the near the annulus where you've torn, clearly that's the best it's ever going to be. And there's a really big chance it's going to get worse. So I think a really sort of thoughtful approach to what's the mechanism of that mild MR and that can really drive the decision as to whether you need to go back and fix it or you, you can accept it. Well, that's really good because we have a couple of cases that demonstrate that. But, you know, we know data now, this is the long-term follow-up of Mayo Clinic. Even mild MR is bad. Even mild MR will knock you off your survival curve long-term. And we expect long-term survival in these degenerative MR patients. So really, we feel that you should aim to do a perfect repair because residual MR at the time of operation begets more MR as the patient walks around. So leave no MR behind. You know, we used to think these kind of data, well, you know, this is mild MR in the OR. Their survival is not as good as zero. It's just not as good. Or ah, maybe we don't need to do a ring. No, they get recurrence of MR. Or, or this one, so we talked about the anterior leaflet one, well, it's okay because anterior leaflet are harder. We can leave a little bit of MR. That's not true. They just do poorly. So we took a different look at our patients. So we looked at 1,600 patients matched pairs of 800 anterior and 800 posterior. And this was uh, presented uh, also at the AATS and is out in JTCVS. And, you know, the anterior is always thought that they do worse than the posterior leaflets. But we looked at ours, and in this group, we left less than trivial, both in the anterior and the posterior. And in fact, in this group, in these matched pairs, you know, really, oop, that's off a little bit. Basically, 90% or more of them had zero MR at the time, both in the anterior and the posterior group. And because of that, you see that their survival in both groups is exactly the same. So it's not the anterior leaflet. It's not the posterior leaflet. It's not bileaflet. It's the MR, which, which of course, biologically makes sense. So, you know, leave no MR behind. That is the best thing for the patient, you know, we really think. And 
And how do you get that? And we're going to talk about different mechanisms, but the perfect repair is fix it how it works. I think when I first started, I had this vision that the cords were somehow pulling the mitral valve shutting, holding it shut. But it's not that at all. It's not that at all. All we're doing is really trying to get a Roman arch, you know, trying to get a keystoning mechanism, no matter what the deformity is. Once that keystone is formed, that Roman arch will shut itself. And if you think of it, this is me standing under Trajan's Victory Arch in Rome, and that's been there for 2,000 years. And I had my wife take the picture. I made her go through first, but, um, you know, she took the picture of me, and for sure I knew it was not going to fall down on my head. And here's me in Ephesus in Turkey. I'm holding up a 3,000-year-old arch. I have to hold it up. <laughs> now, fake news, it's trick photography. I wasn't holding <laughs> up. Because that keystone is dropped in there, that arch is going to stay there forever. And if you think of it, that's exactly how the mitral valve works. Fix it how it works. We want to put both sides of our repair, anterior and posterior, under ventricular pressure, below the plane of the annulus, and it will close itself. And there are many techniques to do that, but that really is the overlying aim that we have when we repair a valve. So, you know, we're going to go through techniques perhaps, and maybe I favor X and Joe favors Y and somebody else favors Z, but the final answer is always the same. So people ask me, oh, do I do a triangular section? Do I do a quadrangular section? Do I use chords, triangles, quadrangulars? Well, if you look at it, it's always a keystone. And if you look at the final result on the right, they always look the same. They always look the same because that is how the mitral valve, you know, really wants to work. So now sort of that is, you know, my diatribe about why you should never leave any mitral regurgitation behind. And we're going to go through a, a case, some of mine, some of Joe's. This is a 72-year-old man with bioleaflet prolapse, ejection fraction 65, normal coronaries, just a routine case. And this is his echo. So he's got severe mitral regurgitation. You know, to my eye, both the anterior and posterior leaflet um, are above the plane. He's got atrialization as a hinge point, meaning the hinge point of his posterior leaflet has migrated up the atrial wall. So, Peter, how, how would you repair this? Yeah, probably, you know, um, use neocords here in this, this case. Um, and um, I'm not sure whether you need to resect something here. Um, but uh, yeah, neocords would be the preferred technique for me here, as far as I can see. So yeah. how about you? A million neocords. <laughs> well, yeah, you need some. Uh, yeah, you need quite a lot of them. I agree with that. Maybe resect some part of the leaflet, but uh, yeah, neocords would be the the main issue here that I would use. So paradoxically, to me, I find these barlows or with have a lot of tissue are the easiest ones to repair because they're forgiving because they have so much tissue in there that you can do almost any technique so i i think a, an option for this patient to regain that roman arch really is you, you could do a primary alfieri you could do an edge to edge repair and a ring and you could do uh, resect the posterior leaflet and put Gore-Tex on the anterior. Yep. You could put a million Gore-Tex cords, the P1, P2, P3 into the anterior. I think they're all correct. They're all correct. So this is what I did. I mean, the first thing when I go in, I said, just look at what we have in here. And you can see you have a lot of tissue. But I think that a surgeon, I would say, Joe, and I'd like to hear your thoughts, they should be comfortable with looking at the echo and then thinking the technique they're going to use when they get in there. Do you agree? I think that's really key because a lot of what you see on the echo not only informs your repair strategy once you're in there, it can inform how you approach the patient sort of from beginning to end. If you're seeing something on the echo that is very complex in a young asymptomatic patient where as you've outlined, your goal is really a perfect repair. That might actually change the sort of enthusiasm with which you're recommending the timing of surgery and maybe even where they get the surgery. Um, but yeah, it absolutely informs your sort of strategy here. And really, you almost know what you're expecting to see before you see the valve. I, I really agree that when I look at the echo, I really know what I'm expecting to see. And I'm almost really thinking already how I'm going to fix it. So then I just take a quick evaluation of the valve here just to make sure that there's nothing goofy going on that have been missed by echo and so on like that. That's my normal approach to it. 
So this one, lots of tissue, lots of resection. So Peter, I think this was what you were talking about is, you know, resect some of the posterior leaflet, yep. really undermine this one because there's so much tissue, you know, to bring the height yep. of the posterior leaflet down. Not really the height, but it's what we call it. And I'd already decided I was going to use Gore-Tex. And now I have the valve completely exploded out. I'm going to put my Gore-Tex in there ahead of time. So, because you have great looks at both the anterior and posterior papilla muscles. I don't use plugets. Joe, do you use plugets? No, just an over and over in the pipettes. Yeah. yeah, me too. Right, yeah. So then somehow I put the posterior leaflet back together again. This one, I moved some primary cords around. You can use Gore-Tex to the posterior leaflet, but somehow recreate that posterior leaflet. So there it is, putting the posterior leaflet down. And then... I'm just testing here to see if I've missed anything else. And I think, oh my gosh, that anterior leaflet is still prolapsing. Oh, good thing I put those Gore-Tex in there. Right. So now I think I'm heading ahead with my plan. And why do I use a ring? At this point in time, I put the ring down because I want to set my Gore-Tex in, in the new geometry, if you were. So obviously the ring is there to bring it back together again. And, and why do I use a ring? Well, it's just math. If you look at the normal situation, the patient has a stroke volume of 60 and a residual volume of 40. So they have hundred cc's. Now they're putting 60 cc's forward and 60 cc's backwards. Now they have 120 cc stroke volume and still maybe 40 in there. So they increase their ventricular volume by 40% and it pulls the annulus open. And so that's why we have to bring that annular diameter back down because they've stretched their rubber band. And, it, and in many cases, that rubber band is not just stretched, it's broken. So, you know, the rubber band is broken. Reestablish the correct diameters of that ellipse of the mitral valve is my thought. Do you, do you so, use any specific tools, Steve, to measure the length of the cords? Uh, when I put cords in, and I'll show you how I do it. So just, um, you know, do I, here's, what I say, you know, people ask me, do I use a complete or incomplete? I tend to use incomplete rings for most of the cases. Do I use rigid or flexible? I don't think it matters. It's not the ring, it's the ringer. I think that's the most important thing. And I know that if something goes awry, we love to blame the ring or more importantly, blame the rep from the company that makes that ring. That's an important step in surgery, but <laughs> mostly it's not the ring, it's the ring. So this is how I do it. And I just set it to the level. I set more get text to the level. I do it all freehand. And I usually just use a double set to the lateral and double set to the medial and just set them to the ring. Right. And then just tie them down freehand down there. Some people put a knot on it at that point in time and test it. I usually just do it freehand right there. And of course, this is the final result of that actual case. And you can see that the Roman arch is how we like it. You can see yeah. the ring, a partial ring. You can see the dot of it posteriorly and that there's a very long zone of coaptation and that it's forming a Roman arch inside the ventricle and it's closing itself. And this was a really, you know, very nice uh, case that could have been uh, done any number of ways. Joe, any comment on this? How would you have done this differently? Yes, although when I started out, that was would have been almost exactly how I'd have done it. Um, I was taught a very sort of classical quadrangular reception, sliding plasty, commissure to commissure approach to that level of leaflet redundancy, and then a chordal based technique for the anterior leaflet. And I used to like to try and find secondary cords that I could move. I'm a bit more confident with a chordal transposition than I was with neocordy, but that's basically it with a with a complete sort of remodeling ring. And my technique has definitely evolved. So I can't remember the last time I needed to do a commissure to commissure sliding plasty. I tend not to use quadrangular resection at all now. I do a really a triangular resection for the vast majority of posterior leaflet prolapse. And I don't use a complete yip ring um, for a lot of reasons, which hopefully we can show in some of the cases. But I, I think that's a really beautiful result. And it really does speak to the importance of the durability, not just of the early competence, but that's something that's going to hopefully look like that in 20 years time. So I think like you, we've all evolved to less resection and that's perfect because I'll go to my next case that I have. I've used incomplete ring for the last 20 years, probably. 
So again, a very straightforward case, 62-year-old severe MR, poster prolapse, rupture, good function, normal coronaries. Very straightforward case. So again, this is a very classic posterior leaflet rupture. She has phileo cords in here. So there's a lot of ways to fix this. You can see, I think she has at least four plus MR. She's got an enormous amount of mitral regurgitation. And you can see on 3D, and I find 3D helpful in making nice slides. I don't think it's very helpful in terms of thinking about the operation because I think the 2D, but really it gives us a lot of uh, pretty pictures. And this is actually what you expect to see when you OR. And I'll go to the interoperative picture, and that's exactly what we see. So this is the OR, and that is exactly what we saw in 3D. So those are the ruptured cords right there. So the first thing I do now is put the annuloplasty sutures in, which I think that pulls it up, the valve up to you and helps your exposure. I really do this first in all cases. So now I have all the stitches in. And then you see that the technique that I used on the first one wouldn't work here because P1 and P3 are really small. You can see the rupture right there. P1 and P3 are very small. And if you did a giant quadrangular resection, you would have nothing left. And then you'd have difficulty. So I try to look for good cords and I'm gonna make a small triangular resection and just imbricate it in here. So I think less tissue, less rupture, less resection. And I think most people, Peter, Joe, you help me out, have gone away from giant resections nowadays. Right, yeah. Especially I think with the introduction of neocords, a lot of people um, uh -huh. tend to use respect instead of resect, isn't it? Well, I'm sure Dr. Carpaccio loves the concept for 35 year career that he didn't respect the valve, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think there's a few reasons to move away from these what well, the very aggressive resections that um we used to be a, a mainstay, even for more limited pathology. And I think one of the things you used to run into, you can sort of just about see it there between P1 and P2, you've got a bit of a cleft. And if you've done a really aggressive resection, right. the next thing you'd be fixing is, is the leak between that cleft. And yes, we were all happily closing clefts as well because they didn't look great on saline testing, but you, you essentially are turning that posterior leaf that, that's got a lot of dynamic moving parts into this sort of very rigid curtain that's really just a buttress for your normal anterior leaflet. And that's actually probably not the basis for a, a durable repair um <clears throat> agree a hundred percent those clefts are there for a reason because the mitral valve actually opens as four leaflets to get out of the way you know if you have two leaflets like an aortic bicuspid that's the biggest you can't make a circle you can only make that big so that's why the clefts are important and i think we used to get into the rob peter to pay paul we'd open a cleft up and then we'd have to sew it back together again so here's i did a very small resection and there's our result yay that was very straightforward. And I put a Simia Plus ring on there. It's a partial band. And this is my result. Yay. And again, this result looks exactly the same as the first one, which I did a huge resection and a bunch of different things. But the result always looks the same to me. See, so, is, is there a reason you're not showing us any post-bypass TEs with color? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Here it is. There it is. Now we, uh, so Joe at our institution, we never use color post our privilege. Uh, seems like a great, <laughs> <laughs> Makes life easier. A great strategy. So actually that, that's a question, Steve, from the audience also. Mm -hmm. uh, after repair, do you, uh, what do you prefer, a ring or a band? Or it doesn't, doesn't matter, actually. So I think it doesn't matter. It's the ring, not the ringer. I tend to prefer a partial band. I think that the dynamics, state of the anterior, I like a partial band, but if you told me I'm going to put a ring on every single patient, I would say that's fine. Right. That's fine. Joe, what is your thought? Well, my first thought is I really like how that repair looks. I, I just love the, it, it was very, you know, you, you can almost tell just by looking at there's no gradient across that valve. Yeah. Um, there's not a trace of MR. Um, you do seem to still have some ability of that posterior relief. That, that you've got a great depth of captation on the previous version without color. I mean, that's just a really, really beautiful result. 
So when I take a look at this, I tell my fellows, if you look above the valve and you see that the sea is blue, you know that the flow is true. The sea is blue, the flow is true. <laughs> Meaning that there's not, yeah, I, this is a two-dimensional representation of you know, a three-dimensional structure, but you don't have MR coming in some other plane out of there. And also you don't have an acceleration zone into the valve, so you have no stenosis. So the sea is blue, the flow is true. So this was, again, this was the other end of the, so the first case I showed on purpose, that was a little older case, uh, a huge resection and so like that, sliding plastics like this. And this is very limited resection. And then I'm gonna show a third case, and then I think that my time is up. Oh, this was the 3D, which again, gives you a nice picture of how the valve is working. Just speaking quickly to your partial rings, where do you start them? I mean, are you going trigone to trigone, commissure to commissure? Where's your start? So name? that's a good question. People ask that all the time, Joe. And I think of it like this. The trigone is a structure of the annulus, in my mind. The commissure is a structure of the leaflet. And so when I think of a ring, I think of the trigone. And I know some people think commissure to commissure, but I measure it from trigone to trigone. But when I measure it, it's more, I'm looking at the area of the clear zone of the anterior leaflet. The way I think, if this is my anterior leaflet hanging down, that's my rough zone that has to hang down. So I take the sizer and just measure it to the clear zone. And it's roughly approximate to trigone to trigone. And in degenerative disease, if you're picking between one that's a little bit smaller and one that's a little bit bigger, take the bigger one in my mind. What are your thoughts? So probably because I'm going, more like commissure to commissure. And one of the reasons why is there's um, a couple of slightly different strategies at my institution. And the surgeon that tends to go trigone to trigone true sizing tends to have more SAM than the surgeon that goes mm. commissure to commissure. Um, so it's true sized and it's more commissure to commissure. I say, you know, SAM, we all have SAM fever and that's a whole nother talk and something like that. But my everyone's incidence of SAM goes down as you become older and older and older. I think you become more aware of what causes SAM. So for my last case here, I'm going to talk about a 68-year-old guy, severe MR, bileaflet prolapse, very much like the first case, good function, normal corners. So this is his echo, small ventricle, good function, big leaflets. The leaflets look kind of lumpy to me. He has a lot of MR. You see the MR is actually coming out of plane, hitting the dome of the left atrium and coming back down the poster wall of the left atrium. So he has four to five plus mitral regurgitation. And this is, this is me post-op. And what did I do there, Peter? I did an Alfieri. So right. this was a, a nice case, I thought, for an Alfieri. The leaflets were kind of lumpy. I could dunk the whole thing. And in my mind, an alfieri is different than doing it in a mitral clip. Obviously, the mitral clip, you have to grab the leaflets from below. An alfieri, actually, you can dunk it all down. The, the leaflets were very lumpy, and so I wanted to dump them all down. And so we came off bypass. We saw it here. There's no mitral stenosis. They're very large orifices. And you can see that there's no acceleration over the top. But there's mild you know, mitral regurgitation here. Now, the Nyquist is down because my anesthesiologists were funning with me, but you know, there is mitral regurgitation. This guy's 73. So what should we do? Joe, what should I do? Well, if he was 73 and, you know, you've been ages clamped and there's a whole bunch of other comorbidity and you're really not. No, this was an alpha area. It was a short case. But yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> there is that. I have no idea what else you did other than an alpha area. Um, you know, if the reason for doing the alpha area was to try and minimize the clamp time in somebody that you were worried no. about. No, then I, I was wouldn't just... be going back for that. But if he was otherwise fine and the alfieri just seemed like a good idea, um, I wouldn't be happy with that. I would go back and fix that. So there's a million ways you could have fixed this. You could have put a lot of Gore-Tex on this patient, both anterior and posterior, I think. You could have resected a little bit, although I, it was pretty lumpy and calcified on both of them. And so I looked at the 3D, and you can see this is really coming out of the lateral orifice. You can see the zonal co-optation is pretty nice, and there's no regurgitation out of the medial orifice, but there is some out of the lateral orifice. And with the color off, you can see what I did. I pinwheeled it. So somehow I got a stray, and I let the, the A2, I probably hooked over to P3. And so it's pinwheeling on itself. And now I have a big eccentric opening you can see on the left. So 
This guy was totally healthy. And the reason I did the alpha area is just, I think it's an okay option for patients who have bileaflet prolapse, who have, I don't think that Gore-Tex is going to serve them as well. You certainly could do that. So I decided I'd go back on because he would tolerate it and so on like that. And you can see what I did is I did another alpha area and I just moved it over like two or three millimeters to the left. And you now have two completely different looking orifices. I mean, you have two equal orifices as opposed to one weird one and one almost closed medially. And if you put color on this 3D, you can see I have no mitral regurgitation whatsoever. So, so Steve, what did you learn about putting this off here stitch? You know, first you did it not right. And the second one, you, you knew how to, to put this off here stitch there. Oh, Any this, for, this wasn't me. This was some other surgeon. Oh, uh, there was another one. Okay. No, but, no I, think, I think in these very lumpy calcified ones, you have to be careful about what A2 and P2 is and put them together. Take your time unfolding a, a lumpy one and really get it in there. People think, one people think that an alpha area is only for bailout. You know, I've done seven yeah. things. I'm 12 hours into the case and I'm going to use an alpha <laughs> area. It's not. It's a very good primary technique. And you can see, again, the C is blue. The flow is true. Right. And this patient well, did extremely well. So I think the point of this is, yeah, I, I moved it over. But the point of this is, if, and Joe is absolutely right in my mind, is you have to, if you've been on bypass for 10 hours with that first run, don't go back on. But, you know, this patient was very healthy and I wanted to give him a perfect result like we got here. Don't leave any MR behind. Right. But what kind of ring do you use with an alpha stitch so or doesn't matter? I use, a, I use a partial. I use the Simia Plus ring on this patient as well. Right. But perfect. I tend to use partial on all of them. Yeah. Anyway, so, so go yeah. ahead. Yeah, that, that was also a question about SAM. Um, any, uh, you said that I can give a whole lecture about SAM. Any short comment on the, on SAM? Well, uh, Joe can comment too, but 90% of SAM is physiologic, that you came off tachycardic, hypercontractile, and underfilled. That causes SAM. You can cause SAM in people who you know, have not had heart surgery. 50, they echoed 50 finishers for the Hawaii Ironman Triathlon, and 50% of them had SAM and MR. They were treated with Gatorade. So, you know, <laughs> and yeah. so slow them down, turn off the drips, fill them up. I'm not really a big fan of beta blocking the heck out of these patients. So I tend to do that. However, if you can see on your echo, 3D is very helpful, that you've left the height, you know, if you will, of the yeah. poster leaflet on, go back on and fix it. You know, it's maybe you made the ring too small, but it's usually that we've left the poster leaflet height if that was a repairable valve when you started in your mind, it is still a repairable valve. It is still a repairable valve. Perfect. Great. So there's, right. there's a, one other question maybe before Joanna starts uh, from Dr. Daniel Di Bardino. Uh, Dr. Cohn always used partial band. Talk us through putting the anterior Gore-Tex in. Over and over, leaflet edge, question mark. Okay. Hi, Dan. How are you doing? Um, so... What I do it is I put it into the rough zone. I go over and over and then pull it down. That's all I do. There's a lot of different ways. I'm not sure that one way is better. Get used to a way. I know people panic about the length of it. The, the length of normal cords are pretty standard. It's like 22 millimeters or something. But again, and there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of uh, give in that. You'd, you'd rather make them a little bit long. The zonal co-optation will catch than making them too short and you'll pull them down. I, I do them over to over. Perfect. Great. Well, I already know that people loved your talk, uh, Steve. Um, <laughs> very, very well exp explained all these different issues and leave no MR behind. So, Joanna, um, looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much. So, um, what I wanted to do is really focus on those of you listening that don't necessarily have 99% repair rates, um, or maybe have a higher need to go back on bypass and reclamp to re fix residual MR. Um, this is not really aimed at those of you, and I think, and I know, having looked at the data, that there are low volume surgeons that repair 99% of valves well and confidently. Um, but there's, there's definitely a sort of group out there that don't. And we sort of touched on this earlier, how most of us have a moved from a strategy that was relatively complex, evolved aggressive resection, 
to a strategy that either involves less resection or even no resection. And this I've really got to credit a surgeon at Cedar sinai called Alfredo Trento with, who really helped me see that a slightly more simplified approach could really help improve certainly the efficiency with which you're sort of done and the reliability of your results across this kind of spectrum of disease. Um, and essentially, it really just involves a triangular resection for most patients. And if it's isolated posterior leaflet prolapse, this is a series of, I think, 1,100 or so robotic um, degenerative repairs. But just because it's done robotically, it, it clearly emphasizes how this is a very straightforward technique for even open. Um, and a partial band, which really works well in the majority of patients. For anterior leaflet prolapse, clearly you have to do something different to support true anterior leaflet flail. And in our hands, that's generally neocordy. And we'll, I've got you know six or seven videos and we can stop when we run out of time or get bored. And in terms of durability, so that's a 99% repair rate across that series. I think we um, replaced 0.7% of those cases. And that's the whole spectrum of degenerative disease. We don't select for robotic. Anybody that's got degenerative diseases a candidate for robotic surgery. Um, and the five-year freedom from moderate, moderate mitral regurgitation, if it's isolated posterior leaflet prolapse there in red, is, is really well above 95%. We've got good data going out to 10 years. So this is not only a high repair rate approach, it's a, a very good durability approach with, I think, a less than 5% incidence of SAM. So you're not dealing with long clamp times, problematic SAM, post bypass, need for second clamp times. We had, again, a less than, I think, 8% need for, 5% need for second clamp. So let's just start with a relatively straightforward um, P2 prolapse here. And let's see if we get it to play. And apologies at the end because the echo clips are a little bit brief and I'll try and pause it intermittently. Simple approach, but the key thing is just deciding where to make your simple cut. So I spend quite a long time trying to figure out where the decent cords are because that's going to be my margin of cut. And if there's any other prolapse that I haven't appreciated on the echo. So I'm sort of looking here at sort of the anterior, the P3 and P1 either side of the obvious P2 um, prolapse and really focusing on trying to find what's a good cord, what do I want to keep? So that's where I think I'm going to make my triangular resection laterally and medially. And I'm kind of curious, so I might as well try and pause it here. What would um, your approach, Peter and, and Steve, be for this straightforward, relatively speaking, P2 prolapse? So I think this is very much like the second case that I showed, not with a robot. Uh, but it's very much the same. And I did the same. I tried to find where the good cords are. That's what you have to take time because you're bringing those good cords into the middle and supporting it. So I think this would be a very limited resection because yeah. it looks like you have a lot of good cords in there. Right. And then just imbricating it together. Yeah. yeah. So resect and, and take the, bring it together, but also probably use some cords as well. Yeah. Here. So again, I think a year or two ago, I'd have taken my resection maybe a cord apart from where I've done it here, but as Steve rightly said, this is a very limited resection. Yeah. And I think that's what's driven people to think, well, maybe you can just imbricate the leaflet without doing the resection. I actually think that gives you actually quite a gnarly sort of lumpy thing that doesn't co-opt well. The key I agree, agreed, is, very, very lumpy. The other thing people have asked me, Joe, is do you have to take that triangle all the way down to the annulus? And I think the answer is no. Yeah, gr great question. I think you don't have to take it down to the annulus. Um, and the other thing is, if you haven't got your triangle quite right, you can imbricate a little bit more as you get down to the annulus. And what I want you to look at as you look at this first stitch, um, this stitch is really essential. It, it's what gives you your smooth coaptation zone. I'm going really, really distal, and I'm taking a bite that's going to imbricate, it's going to enfold the leaflet. I'm not going to have the sort of edge of tissue so again, here, I'm going very, very distal, right at leaflet edge. It's almost partial thickness, this first bite. And I want the edges to kind of roll in like that and be a smooth surface of co-optation. Um, you can almost do anything you like with the stitches that follow this, this, these stitch, this stitch, but this, this one's absolutely key. Um, and you can see how smooth that, that, that edge of that leaflet co-optation zone is going to be once that's tied. 
And genuinely, I think that makes far more difference to the freedom from any residual MR than I sort of realized when I started out. I used to just kind of smack it together, um, like a bit like a sandwich, bunk function interrupters, <laughs> but it really does make a difference if you can get that nice and smooth. Now, this is a similar plus ring, which I think is it's just a really fabulous, nice, easy to use. And there I'm looking for, this was a little hard. Um, there was a big um, jet lesion that kind of obscured the trigone and the commissural area there. But what I'm looking for is I'm, I'm trying to see the um, trigones and the commissural area. I'm holding that little notch up to it on the um, medial side and then having a look at the lateral side and just making sure I can see it there. And I took the ringer size down. I think I started with the 36 and ended up with a 34. And I don't mind if that posterior annulus is a bit big. That, that's kind of the whole point of the band is to sort of bring that in. So, and so I, I, can I ask yeah, for yeah. the sizing? You just looked at the trigones um, with the sizer, and did you do anything else? And yeah, so basically, side? this is the area that I'm trying to see. So it's almost where I'm putting this first needle bite here. That's what I'm looking at the sizer. So that notch on the sizer, I want to see it there, yeah. and then I want to see it here on this side. And I really don't mind what's happening with the annulus here. This right. is what I'm looking at. Um, and I'm not, I think when, um, and Steve, correct me if I'm wrong, when you say you're going for the um, trigones, you're here, and we're not talking about the, the intercommercial distance, which is sort of down, down That's low. Correct. Now. But correct. one thing interesting that you said very quickly is these patients sometimes will, because P2 is rocked back and they have an eccentric jet, it is hitting the trigone and you have a jet lesion a scar. Sometimes you can't see the annulus very yes. well. So take your time putting the stitch into the right area because sometimes it's very scarred over from that jet lesion just hitting and hitting and hitting and i don't know if you appreciate it from the video that's exactly the case here it actually took a minute or two to figure out what was leaflet what was wall because it was right. all sort of this jet lesion i and think one of the biggest things that i see when i do redos of other people's is this com this trigone stitch is not in the right place it's the hardest one to see it's underneath the aorta and they just don't take their time and get that stitch and it's either in the atrial wall or it's in the leaflet and then it tears out and then the whole annular ring starts popping off. And, and the other reason it tears out, it's not just because it's in the, you've done it in the atrial wall, you've done it in the leaflet. I, I, these are superficial bites, these first two. I'm pretty paranoid about dinging the circ, circumflex up here. Um, so they're not super deep bites. I, I do want them in the annulus but I'm going very, very parallel to the annulus. I'm, I'm not trying to date, take, take deep sort of perpendicular bites there. So it's a real kind of balance and a lot of attention to detail there. And then as you finish, you can see where we're sort of coming up on um, this side. And again, just trying to get that. I think it's a little bit lower than the trigones. I, I always try and I, I don't go all the way up, but um, th that's essentially how, how I use this band. And when you're doing a limited resection technique, and I don't want to sort of belabor Sam, but I think if I'd done that technique and used a remodeling ring um, and true sized it with a remodeling ring, I think I'm at much more risk of Sam than if I've used this very sort of um, open, flexible band. The saline test is just to tell me if there's residual um, prolapse. I'm not looking at it to, to be watertight. I just want to make sure, I mean, it's lovely if the ventricle sucks down and the valve sucks in and it's completely watertight, but my key thing is I just want to make sure that there's no residual prolapse and I'm not going to go back and fix leaks based on the saline test. And this is brief, but um, it was a, a, a respectable um, post-bypass TEE. So, the um, the sea is blue, the flow is true, Joe. Is there, there was a question from the audience from David Fergese. Is there an alternative to saline injection test for a better assessment? You use saline, but you said you don't pay attention when it's really watertight, uh, Joanna. Well, so I think th there's a few adjuncts. So there's A, just making sure you've treated the lesion that you saw in the and you saw in the um, OR. B, the saline test. Three, ink it. If you, sometimes if you ink the saline test, you can see very, very clearly the depth of coaptation, any areas that are kind of above um, that shouldn't be. Um, but interoperatively, no. I mean, um, Steve, is there anything else that you use other than... So, no, I use the saline test. It's obviously not 100% foolproof. I like to see the ventricle come up and the leaflets kiss together and so on like that. But again, the ventricle is not twisting. You have to get a fair bit of saline in there to drive the papillary muscles down. I like to just tap the aorta to make sure that I have some pressure, a rough approximation of the pressure that I have. And it is not foolproof. Have I ever had a perfect sailing test and then come off and have regards? Of course I have. I think everyone yeah. has. And so 
then you really with the heart beating. So if you come off and now your sailing test was perfect and your heart beating, you have to take a very good look at the echo because you're going to go back on, you're going to stop the heart, you're going to do the sailing test, it's going to look perfect again. You have got to make up your mind on that echo before you stop the heart again. What is going on? Yeah. And, yeah. and I think actually sort of using valve hooks to pull up the valve, um, if you're in that situation, perfect sailing test, bad echo, um, tells you where there's residual prolapse or gaps and probe all your um, leaflet margins and you really use the echo to guide you. Um, so we're sort of going backwards in time. The last case was a case from yesterday. This one's a case from earlier in the week. And again, it's a, a P2 prolapse, but with sort of a bit of interesting stuff going on at the commissures. That's kind of an abnormal commissure. It's fused. Yeah. Um, it kind of presents a little bit of a additional challenge. It's not just a sort of isolated P2 with one ruptured cordy. And again, I'm just kind of working slowly around the valve, thinking about that commissure. Am I going to need to do anything for that? Does this commissure prolapse in any way, shape or form. There's a little bit of redundant tissue, but it seems to be a reasonable height. And same with the anterior leaflet, a little bit, you know, th that looks like a very normal height anterior leaflet. So that's always sort of reassuring. You kind of know if you fix the posterior leaflet issues, that this should work really well. And I'm curious at this, this point, um, Steve or Peter, would you do anything with that slightly weird looking um, commissure here? I would think about, yes, it is slightly yeah. weird looking in, an, in our vernacular at our place, we would say that looks poofy. It sort of poofs up and we probably would do a commissural advancement in that corner. We'd pinch it forward a little bit. We take some four width bonds and we imbricate it down into the ventricle. Because even if you do your sailing cast and even if it looks pretty good, you just wonder like, okay, in 10 years, am I going to see this guy back with a commercial blowout there? We would probably do something to it. So, but it is a kind of fusion between the anterior and posterior leaflet there, is it? Yeah, it, I mean, the commish is definitely, I, I think, fused. It, it's not um, normal. And I think the sub-apparatus was, was slightly abnormal too. Um, so I, I, think, um, I think if you're feeling confident about correcting that, yes. And then there's a bunch of ways you could fix it. You could put cords in, you could resect it. You could sort of do an edge to edge there. I think that's- I just, just, Yes, I would do an edge to edge really to exclude that end of the valve almost. So again, this is a really um, a very simple, slightly more aggressive, but not very aggressive triangular resection. Again, very much dictated by where the good cords were either side of that. So again, I'm really being careful to conserve that cord just to the left of where I'm cutting there, because that's the, those are good cords that support this well. Um, so it's I'm not shy about taking a small amount, but I do think taking something it makes a big difference. You, you don't want to just try and imbricate this to get rid of it. And then again, this first, very first suture right at the edge, and it's a, a mattress suture so that you're going to imbricate the edges. So it's going to be a completely smooth um, zone of carptation. And that makes such, such a difference. Um, this is a cardionyl, which is, is nice to use because it doesn't have a memory like proline, so it doesn't kind of flip around. It's it's 5-0, it's, it's robust, it's um, very easy to tie with um, doing an instrument tie. I think again, so. you said I wasn't something... quite distal enough. I've just gone even just that little bit more distal. I really, really want to get the edge of that leaflet super, super precisely. Everything else, you can just push your suit, you know, you can give the, the needle drive over to the resident. They can do the rest of this closure. But this one stitch really makes a difference to whether that's going to be nice and competent. Sorry, sorry, Steve, you were going to no, say. No, I thought you said something that's very important that I'd like to emphasize. There's no reason to take cords that are good. Yeah, if the absolutely. cords are the right length and they're behaving, just leave them there. And it's a little different with a quadrangular resection. Sometimes you do need to take the cords either side of the resection that are good because they'll restrict the leaflet when you bring it together. But that's almost the opposite of what you get with a triangular resection. You just right. keep all of those good cords. Yeah. So here again, I'm really looking for that um, area just below the trigones, just above the commissures. And you can see the notch in the valve there, I think. And I want to get it up there on this side. And then I'm going to check and see this side. So again, I put the notch here and I want to see it against that area. And I really don't care what's happening here. I'm just using those notches to size across the valve um, at this point. And then we've just gone up a size. Um, so again, and these are nice um, sizes. They're flexible, so you can put them through even just a, a port, a robotic port if you want to, um, with obviously a suture tied onto them so you don't lose them. Um, but again, I'm comparing this little notch, then I want to see it on that side. 
really carefully looking at the trigones and again this this first stitch right up there just kind of above the commissure and it's again it's a slightly superficial stitch i really make sure that i'm in the annulus so i'm not in the leaflet i'm not in the atrial wall it's not a giant stitch the first stitch is quite small um and these bands just work really beautifully um did, did you change to bands when you started doing robotic surgery i or? did i did and i think in retrospect i'd have probably changed earlier if i'd been more confident that i'd always get a good sort of result <laughs> repair and I, I think what i liked about rings was that you always felt you were sort of pulling everything together and it would sort of yeah. but it so many times you put your valve sutures in, you do your leaflet repair, and the thing is watertight before you've even put the ring in. And then you put the remodeling ring in, and suddenly it wasn't watertight <laughs> anymore you, because you've changed the structure of the valve. And sometimes you have to adapt the leaflets to fit the ring, which, which makes no sense. And you never get that with a band. Basically, if it doesn't leak before you put the band in, it won't leak after you put the band in when you've sized it right. And it's it, it's it, it just seems like a more physiological solution. So again, I, I, I'm taking the retractor out. This, mm -hmm. this is a little bit important. I take the retractor out to do the saline test. That's the other thing I used to do um, was always leave the retractor in because it's been so hard to get your exposure. And the remodeling rings allow you to do that with impunity. But if you're using a band, you've got to take the retractor out because it will just, and I don't know, Steve, if, if you do that, but it will sort of distort your anatomy and you won't get a nice... Um, yeah, so two comments. One, I think with your retractor pulling, you can distort the anterior leaflet. You don't see that with a remodeling ring because it's too stiff in there. So we tend to either drop it down or so, something like that. The other thing is I I haven't used a ring for you know primary degenerative MR probably 20, 25 years. I was a band person for a long time. And I think if all you say is correct. And I think some of it is to do to if you don't get the actual spacing across the anterior leaflet, which you don't want to buckle too much. If you don't get it perfect, you may buckle it. And suddenly that anterior leaflet is not behaving like it was before you put the ring down. So I'm really have been a, a ring and I mean a band and not a ring person for decades now. Right. The other thing that I do the saline test that I didn't used to do was um I use it to de-air the heart. So keep the anterior leaflet open, put the saline in, like actually prop it open as you're injecting saline so the whole ventricle is filled with water. There's no air fluid level. And then once you're happy with your saline test, leave the ventricle pressurized with saline, close the left atrium, let the left atrium fill. Once you've closed the left atrium, put your vent on. You will almost spend no time de-airing after that. It's a very, very effective way to de-air the heart. So Interesting. With it's regards to the retractor, uh, jo Joanne, is, uh, Dr. DiBardino again says, which kind of retractor do you use? Oh, so this one is the dynamic robotic retractor, and it's it's literally got these two prongs that you can see. And that's kind of, I think, transformed robotic surgery because it means, you know, you can do put it under the anterior leaflet to do your subvalvular work. It, it's just a beautiful retractor. If I'm doing a mini thoracotomy without the robot, then it's the the, the that the, the, the Geister sort of, um, you know, I, I can show you a picture. It's it's a very nice retractor if you're doing it um, sort of non non robotically. But that the retractor that you're seeing here is a, it's the one that comes with the Da Vinci. So here here's a fun bileaflet um, prolapse. Um, and I think I'm sorry, I kind of talked over the echo. So the echo looked billowing. It wasn't kind of like an anterior leaflet flail. It definitely has a sort of high zone of coaptation. Any thoughts as we're looking at this valve? What you guys would do? Well, you know, this is one of the valves that the posterior leaflet looks like it comes in many bits and pieces sometimes. You know, they don't have three distinct uh, parts to it. There's, there's again, you know, in my mind, there's a lot of ways to fix this. Uh, this is one I'd probably use Gore-Tex in. Gore-Tex certainly to the anterior leaflet. I don't know and what yeah, I do to the posterior There's also leaflet. quite abnormal cords at that sort of P1 area again. So... Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things you could choose to fiddle with. And there's that big cleft there between the A2 and sort of A3. So mm -hmm. a lot of things that you could choose to address. And I think what I wanted sort of people watching to get a feel for is that you don't have to address all of them. You might see a lot of lesions and you might cause some lesions, depending on how you approach this with a repair. But you don't actually have to fix every single lesion. Um, sometimes just fixing the, 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 the guilty culprit is enough to get a really good result. So... A lot of time thinking about where to where to make this cut, which are the good cords. The cords just behind the scissors are actually really good, perfect height, kind of robust. So we're taking that triangular resection now. Um, 
down pretty much towards the annulus because obviously there's a lot more tissue here than the previous valves. You, you, you do want to do it quite wide and really take, get rid of some of that sort of redundancy. And that will also bring the height down a little bit. Um, it's not such a um, imperative to reduce the height if you're using a partial band. Um, so that's the other reason why you don't kind of need to worry about sliding plasty and cordal reconstruction to try and reduce the height of that. You're probably going to be perfect once you've got back to, you see there that beautiful normal cord that's supporting the, that side of the triangular resection. Um, and again, this sort of really careful approach to imbricating the very sort of edge, edge leaflet. And I'm conscious that we're sort of close to time here. So I will potentially advance it because I think you'll get a good sense of um, how this looks. I agree with you, Joe. When you're doing a triangular section, this stitch, the free edge stitch, I think of it, is really the most important stitch that lines everything up. Um, and you can you can put you can run the rest of the leaflet or put interrupted, doesn't matter. So, so that was the ring that we went for, um, which we've talked about how to size it. And I will advance. I didn't do anything to that. I think I put two um, looks like magic sutures in at that commissure just to sort of take that out of the equation. Have, have you ever used core knots for? So for all of these, I use core knots. Yeah. Okay. And again, it, it's just a lot of people run this if they're, they're doing this robotically. I, I, again, no strong feelings either way, but core knots are really um, straightforward solution. And it allows us just to do it as we go, which gives you sort of great exposure. Mm -hmm. um, and then the next last thing is the saline test and then hopefully the post bypass echo. So again, I'm just looking for the evidence, any evidence of residual prolapse. I don't necessarily need this to be completely watertight. The retractor's out, really sort of horrible visualization, but I think you get a sense there that that's not um, prolapsing and that's a fairly respectable result on the echo. So. I'll stop there. We'll, we'll, we, we had some very good ones with cords, but I think uh, Steve showed great ones with cords, so we maybe don't need to go through those. Yeah, excellent. So so how many cases do you do with the robot? All, of them. All, All of, them. of them. The only contraindications for the robot for me are if they've got more than sort of mild to moderate AI, because I'm using a single dose cardioplegia strategy, or any contraindications to femoral cannulation, so really grotty peripheral vascular disease, but mm -hmm. other than that, no indications, contraindications. Yeah. So you, you do you make a scan before this before surgery to look at the, the vessels or yeah we CT scan everybody from neck down to groin to look at the aorta the IVC the femorals um, yeah right if you have to go back in for a bleeding uh, what do you do don't jinx me I haven't had to do that. oh you haven't do <laughs> oh that's great don't jinx me <laughs> but, but if you if there would be a bleeding. I think if there was, again, I think you, hopefully you've got a sort of a, a clue where your bleeding's from, because that obviously dictates what you should be doing. Um, and even if you've just done a completely poor endoscopic approach, anyway, I would suggest you convert that to a mini thoracotomy and that should allow you to have decent access to address any bleeding. The only bleeding I've ever seen a colleague have that couldn't be remediated via the thoracotomy was unfortunately from the left atrial appendage. You see we over so most of them routinely. I don't do that. I don't quite have um, that level of confidence or efficiency. Um, I'll over sew them for um, atrial fibrillation, but uh, I've seen one one instance of bad bleeding that couldn't be fixed via the thoracotomy and had to get right. converted to a stenotomy just from the left atrial appendage. So, so closing the left atrial appendage, you do it from the inside? Yes, a, a double layer Gore-Tex uh, 4.0 hand sewn from the inside. Steve, what do, what do you do with the left atrial? Uh, I either close it from the inside with a double layer or I clip it from the outside. Right. With any any uh, thing that which one is more effective? Do you think, or is no difference? I don't think there's very good. I mean, there's good data from the old Cleveland Clinic study that shows that a you know circular one is a very bad idea. Uh, but I think the double we've had really very little instance where you uh, have it open up if we use the double air closer, basically because you're putting the wall to the wall. In the atrial clip, we've had you know great results with two from the outside. Yeah. Uh, another question comes in there. Are there situations where the CG future bend is preferred um, over the simulus ring? Is one easier to use with a robot? So my sense is that both are relatively easy, but the Simaplus I really like simply because um, the 
lanyard the sizer is completely flexible um the ring is very flexible it just really suits the the technique right so we have a couple of minutes left for for questions so uh how many full stenotomy repairs have you done before you switched to robotic um i probably operated through a stenotomy for 10 years before i switched to robotic right. and the key to switching to robotic was being the only learner on the team i cannot imagine how you switch to robotic if you're also trying to train the whole team and i think the people who haven't done robotic have a ten, and i would sell, include myself in this before i started to underestimate how important the bedside surgeon is you need an expert bedside surgeon that they're absolutely critical to your blood pressure remaining at a normal level and being able to do this without a learning curve and without compromising outcomes so um yeah, I was very comfortable around the mitral valve before I switched and I had done a reasonable amount of mini thoracotomy. And one of the reasons I switched to robotics because I wasn't entirely satisfied with the exposure and the ease of the mini thoracotomy just using my instruments. I, I still wasn't getting what I wanted in terms of ability to see the valve and be super precise and thoughtful about it, which you, you know, absolutely have with a robot. So I think that's a great answer because I think the casual mitral surgeon should not do robotic surgery. I think that's a mistake. and people look at it like marketing and advertising and so on like that. Obviously we have three, you know, pretty high volume microsurgeons. Matt Romano is here at Michigan. Gaurav Alawadi is here at Michigan. I'm here at Michigan. And, you know, I think those people who want to start up, you know, a robotic program, that's fine. I, you know, you do a sternotomy, thoracotomy, a mini thoracotomy, sternotomy, it doesn't matter how you get there as long as you get a perfect repair every time. But I think, again, even more importantly, mitral valve volume, you know, determines your mitral repair rate. And I think it should not be picked up by someone very casual. So I think what you said was very, very important. Yeah. And in case this is helpful, I'm just showing a quick, um, this is anteriorly flip flail, um, which we fix, we're obviously fixing with um Gortex neocordian because you'd asked about pledge it. So this is, it's exactly what um, Steve did. It's a, just an over and over into the head of the papillary muscle, no pledge it. Um, and then basically I'm going to bring the same one out um, through the leaflet over and over each arm of the needle separately and tie it so that the leaflet um, comes to the posterior annulus and no further. Um, and, and both of the um, Gortex cords are kind of straight when you pull the leaflet to the anterior annulus, I mean, to the posterior annulus. Right, I agree that the annulus is your marker level for this. Yeah, I, I'm definitely not as facile as I think many are with this. I, it's, it's, I'm always a little bit less certain this is going to be a good result than I am with just a nice resection or a cordial transfer, but uh, yeah. Excellent. Well, these are great demonstrations. And, uh, you know, looking at the questions and the comments that I got, it's people loved it a lot, this, this session. So having these two great experts, uh, you know, time really flies. So we're already over the hour. So I want to thank you both very, very much for this very insightful uh, discussion, hallway conversation that you had. Although we're in another hallway, I, I think we all see now the numbers of COVID going down. So hopefully, you know, the next meeting will be a hallway conversation in real life and that we can attend. So I want to thank you both very much. Um, I want to thank the audience for their questions and for watching the program. And please, if you can, um, fill out the evaluation form and send uh, us the feedback of what you thought about this program. Great. Great to have you here. Uh, looking forward to uh, another conversation on mitral repair. Uh, thank you all very much. And uh, until uh, we see each other again, hopefully in, in real person. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. Bye now. Bye.